Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, make us worthy to celebrate the feast of your ascension. We raise our pure hands to you in prayer, our chaste souls to you filled with grace, and our sincere hearts to you with love. We yearn for that place to which you have ascended, so that with the host of the angels we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one who came into the world from the Father. He was hanged upon the cross and buried in the tomb and raised up from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Christ by your ascent by <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> oh Christ by your ascension you ended your stay upon the earth completed your plan of salvation and returned to the father to prepare a place for us so that we may be where you are you taught us the way to the place where you were going and you told us to follow you. When Thomas asked of you, we do not know where you are going, how can we know the way? You answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to walk with us the way that leads to the Father. Turn our eyes toward him, strengthen our desire to be with him, and guide our steps that we may reach the Father through you and with you. We praise you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Christ our Lord, accept the fragrance of this incense, which we have offered unto you on the feast of your ascension into heaven. Grant that we may prepare ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit, whom you promise to send out to us. And may we take the places that you have prepared for us, in the presence of the Father, I meet you in the heavenly kingdom. And we praise you, your Father, and your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Therefore I too, 
hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus and of your love for all the holy ones, do not cease giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, resulting in knowledge of him. <clears throat> may the eyes of your hearts be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope that belongs to his call. What are the riches of glory in his inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe in accord with the exercise of his great might, which he worked out in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every principality, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things beneath his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Praise be to God always. up with shouts of joy. The Lord goes up with trumpet blast. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. <coughs> <clears throat> From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint John, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. When Je Judas had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and he shall glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I have told the Jews, <clears throat> you, will, you will look for me, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm very sorry. <clears throat> you will look for me, and as I have told the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. And so I now I say to you, I give you a new commandment. Do you love one another as I have loved you? So you also should love one another. 
And this is how all shall know that you are my disciples, if you have this love for one another. This is the truth, peace be with you. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So charity is central to the entire gospel message. And it is probably also one of the most misunderstood virtues that there is. It is requires, charity requires us of a clear thinking. You know, in the theological virtues, they directly plug us into God. That's why they're called theological, from theos, for God. And so faith is illumination of the intellect, of the spirit, but which influences the will. Hope and charity are seated in the will, but influence the intellect. So they're not just merely virtues. They are direct connections with the divine. And it's why our Lord gives this commandment. He calls it new, that you love one another. So we ask the question, well, what's new about this? We love our parents, we love our cousins, we love our brothers and sisters. There are things that just come to us naturally. And that's precisely it. This is not something natural. This is something supernatural. It requires us to go outside of ourselves. It is not mere sentiment, nor is it fuzzy thinking. And that's why the newness of the commandment, because in the Old Testament, you were commanded to love your kinsmen, Israel, your tribal, your clan. And that's pretty straightforward, but it's still already something. That's why when our Lord takes that commandment from Deuteronomy, that you shall love your reacha as yourself. Reacha is a kinsman. And our Lord opens it up. This is why you continually have these people questioning our Lord. Because our Lord says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He replaces reacha with the idea of the one who is proximate, the one who is near us, which is what neighbor means. And the newness of it is not just that teaching. Our Lord did that during years. He transformed the law of the Old Testament and expanded it. He didn't change it. It's not a new commandment, but he expanded it. It's beyond your kinsmen. It's beyond your clan. It's beyond your tribe. Everything that the modern world is talking about, I found my tribe. This is my place on social media. This is that. All of that is precisely what our Lord did not teach. And it's exactly what he came to overturn, this kind of tribalism. And so he's questioning, continue, what does this mean, the one who is proximate, the one who is near me, my neighbor? It's what incites the whole parable of the Good Samaritan, the question from the lawyer, the question from the legal scholar, and who is my neighbor? And so our Lord is making it very clear. This is a new commandment, this virtue of charity. Because it is saying, he says to us very explicitly, why is it new? That you love one another as I have loved you. This as I have loved you is what makes it new. You have to imitate me. You see it in the Husoyo today. To put us on our path, walk with us and be with us on our way toward the Father. And that aspect is precisely the whole aspect of the Ascension, which is why the Church has asked us to consider this text today from St. John, which is actually from the Last Supper. So you notice the first line, it says that when Judas had left, 
This episode is framed by Peter and by Judas. So in the middle of this lesson, when our Lord says it, that I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, he's talking first about the church. These are the apostles who are with him at the Last Supper. And that charity then has to redound in that expansion of what we know as being neighbor. And this is hard because it requires us to go out of ourselves and it makes us think about it. You know, normally these days, people will talk about charity as if it were just to be nice. Now, being nice is fine, but being nice is an emotional thing. And it just also means primarily that you've been well-educated. You're not rude, you're nice. And that's a good start. But the pagans can do that. The pagans cannot love as the Son of God incarnate can love. None of us can without grace. So grace is given to us to expand so that first of all, our vision is larger than our hearts. Hearts in the sense of our sentiment. And this is the problem with Judas. The frame now, we'll talk about the framework of how these two men get it terribly wrong. And they both will wind up sinning very terribly during this time of the passion of our Lord, but for completely different reasons. Judas is sinning gravely, and this chapter is where our Lord, after showing the very sign of friendship to Judas, our Lord has been trying to rattle Judas's cage for the last 12 months, speaking indirectly to him at Capernaum a year before in the teaching of the Eucharist. And also even up until the present moment that one of you will betray me this night. And even when Judas comes to betray him, our Lord again calls him friend. Judas's problem, I wouldn't, he's not demonic. Judas is just like you and me. He lives in illusion. He's a religious man. But in illusion, he doesn't really understand what the religion really teaches him. We've done this before on Good Friday or during Holy Week to talk about what is Judas's fall. Judas, <clears throat> in my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Judas's intention is not to have our Lord killed. This will sound strange. Judas is to try to provoke our Lord into working a miracle. This is what I would give as the being interpretation of the text. If we always make Judas look like some demonic creature, some kind of extraterrestrial monster, then it doesn't really phase us because, well, that's Judas, that's not me. But in fact, what Judas does is actually, in many ways, very understandable. But the problem is it's all too human. This is why Judas is misunderstanding our Lord completely, even after these years of being with him. How many years can we be a Catholic and go on and just live in our illusions thinking we know what Christianity is? How often are our prayers each day to say, Lord, teach me, transform me, turn me inside out, illuminate my spirit, allow me to see more clearly, inspire me as to how I should see and judge. This is what Judas is not doing. And when Judas receives the very sign of friendship from our Lord, where he takes some of the bread off the table and he puts it in Judas's mouth, it's to indicate to John the apostle who the one is to betray him without denouncing him in front of the whole table. So nobody pays attention to this. But, they are, but some of them overhear him when he says what you do, do quickly. And Judas leaves. That's the beginning of today's gospel. And then he talks about this charity. And again, this misunderstanding of charity. The charity is not sentiment. Charity is spirit and will. We choose to be charitable. It doesn't happen to us. And that's why we know that if we are not actively in our prayer life and consciously working to become more charitable day by day, then we're not being charitable. Because it requires conscious thought and it requires the expansion of the will outwardly in that thought and vision. So Judas messes it up because he doesn't have the proper vision. 
He sees only the way that he can manipulate and coerce events that will be, he'll say, beneficial for our Lord. But it's also beneficial for him because he's one of the disciples. But when this episode is finished, Peter is the one who pipes up. And he says, well, even if everyone else betrays you, I'm never going to betray you. I'll die with you. So he has a good sentiment. It's a good emotion. He's being nice. Doesn't want our Lord to feel isolated on this night. No, 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 no. Even if everyone else takes off, I'm always going to be faithful. I love you, Jesus. I just love you, Jesus. I just love you, Jesus. Our Lord doesn't say, those who say this over and over again will be the proof. He says, they will know that you are my disciples because you love one another as I have loved you. It is the very sign of the gospel, charity. But again, it's not just being nice. And so this is why Peter is just going to completely collapse within the next 12 hours. Because the very thing our Lord asked him, he says, you think you'll be faithful. And then, of course, he famously says, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. You can imagine Simon being completely crestfallen, just completely gutted. If our Lord appeared to us in our daily prayers and said, well, how are you going to offend me today? Excuse me, Lord. Well, you offended me yesterday numerous times. How are you going to do it today? That's the kind of answer given to Simon. You think you're good but you're running on pure sac uh, saccharine and sentiment, and this will not sustain you. Before dawn tomorrow, you will have denied me three times. And so St. John frames this, and the inspired text frames it for us to understand exactly what this charity is in the middle. So what I want to leave you with is, well, when we talk about charity, we're not going to do a definition of charity. But it is a fascinating thing to see, and we will come back next week Last week, we did the idea of revelation of male and female, and the revelation of mothers and womanhood and all of this. We're going to come back to this next week from Pentecost, because it's also part of the revelation of God of what is human. But in the meantime, it's very providential that we have this moment in which we focus on charity. What is truly love? What is agape? What is caritas? And that's why it's important also in the old, you see it in the older scriptural quotations, the older scriptural translations. In the new translations, everything's love. Love, 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 love. But there are distinctions in the Greek text as to what kind of love is love. Because they have numerous ways to speak about the idea of the desire of benevolence and beneficence. It's not just all. Our language in English is very, very, very poor when it comes to explaining or to articulate, to express the idea of affection and the pursuit of benevolence and beneficence. And that reflects itself on us culturally when we're just kind of all just sentimentalist at best. And so that the poor gospel has just been reduced to this idea of sugary feel-goodness. But our Lord is telling us, you must love one another like I have loved you and I am going to die in the next 24 hours. That is the sign of what truly charity is, of what love is. This is why we have to always remember the context of where this commandment is given. It's not just the impact that it's basically our Lord's last will and testament. He's going to die within the next hours. It's not just that that already has a poignancy. But he's saying that you must also do this. So it requires that larger vision. That is the inspiration of the spirit that comes with the gift of faith and the gift of charity. And the gift of charity is rooted in the will, but it influences the spirit and the mind of expanding our vision. In order to do good and to choose good, to wish good, to desire good, and to do good, to accomplish this, benevolence and beneficence but as Christ did. So that's what I want to leave you with, is what is the foundation of the aspect of this charity? There are times in which there are no feelings whatsoever. No one will say that our Lord felt good in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had the beatific vision, he's the Son of God, all of that is true. 
But in the garden, there is no good feeling going on here. And yet, it is the greatest example of what love, of what charity is. And there's no feeling of goodness. Charity shatters our illusions. It makes us look outside of ourselves and then makes the will to choose to do good and then the beneficence to accomplish the good that we can in our lives. And why is this a sign then of the presence of God incarnate on the earth? It's a sign because of the very reality of who the word of God is. You think about this doctrine of the Trinity. We know it. We recite it each day in the creed. We know the Trinity, we know our catechism. But we rarely think about why is it revealed to us? There is only one God, this we know. But God reveals to us that his very essence of what and who he is, is Trinity. In other words, everything that the Father has and everything that the Father is, he gives to the Word. This is the generation. And everything that the Word has and is, he receives from the Father, and he reciprocates that infinite and eternal love in the present moment. And between the two of them, this eternal love expresses itself in spirit of holiness. Now we know this doctrine, but what is it teaching us? It's teaching us that the very essence of what we have been created, the reality that we have been created as images are, are completely ordered to the other. The Father is completely, was not Father without the Word, without the Son. Son is not the Son without the Father. They are relationships. They are an ordering to another. And the very definition of the human person is that we are ordered to one another. That's just by nature. Now we know that because we're born as, you know, bumbling little drooling leaking things that go on for years, decades even. So we're taught even by nature that we are dependent upon one another. And that's a beautiful thing, ultimately. I was talking to one of the families recently, and they talked about one of, their, one of their grandchildren and how this grandparent was just standing in complete admiration and clearly parental pride because their child, who is now a parent with the coming of this grandchild, is completely different now. They stand up straighter. They show a great amount of pride and a great amount of seriousness in their life that they did not show two years ago because it's a baby. Babies make us orient ourselves to them. Otherwise, they die, and that's a horrible thing. They make us become greater than we would be otherwise in our illusion, in our Judas deception. About, it's all about me. So when our Lord says that I give you charity, my love, my love is that this giving, the Father gives his Son to the world, the Son gives himself in this life in the incarnation. He gives himself to death on Calvary. It's all about the orientation and direction towards the other. And so when he says that you must love one another as I have loved you, we use the term selfless and we know what that means. I mean, we know the word. But its fundamental reality is that we are turned towards others. We are turned towards them, but not just on a natural level, but on a supernatural level. And so this is kind of the interim. We will come back to the gender question next week. But the interim is this idea of understanding of what our Lord asks us to do. And the very first step in this is realizing it's not to be just nice. This requires blood. This, re this burns. This will cost our lives and transform us. But that's okay. Because even if we don't know where charity truly occupying a space in my life will lead me, I know that it will be better than where I am now. That's all I have to know. That's the virtue of hope. And then we learn how to start letting go of those illusions. This is why going back to Judas and Peter, Judas, of course, you know, finishes by in despair and committing suicide. Peter ends his story by conversion, by repentance, 
And in the Roman tradition, so much repentance that there are furrows in his face from the tears that he shed for the rest of his life because of this one night. So what's the difference between the two of them? They both betray our Lord. They're both deceiving themselves. The difference is, is that Judas would not let go of his illusions, his prejudgments, his own self-conceptions, his own little ideological world. And because he wouldn't let that go when it was shattered, he had nothing but despair as a conclusion. Peter didn't cling on to those illusions. He knows now, yeah, I'm not going to die with you. At least not yet. But he had to let go of that illusion that I'm a really good Catholic here. And letting it go, he allowed that charity to work within him. And so this is a very beautiful, it's a very small gospel we have today, is it not? And yet the riches of the entire gospel is found in these few lines. And so let us ask the Lord God that he shine his light upon us and truly give us a reciprocated desire to be transformed and to be transfigured by this charity, that we be turned towards the other, that we begin to understand this relationship that God is asking of us and giving us to accomplish by his grace. And in do doing so, the Good Shepherd will lead us to beautiful pastures that are filled with richness and of nourishment. Even if I can't see them now, I know that state will be better than where I have lived up until now. This is Christian conversion. This is the grace we desire to have during these days of the Ascension. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, unsubstantial with the Father, through him.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now receive these offerings which your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, Saints Constantine and Helena. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering. St. John Chrysostom on page 876. 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, of love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. Love and faith, brothers and sisters, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of peace be with us. O Lord, on all Hidden from all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom, through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you are adored by all, angels bless.
bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you with purity and with holiness. May we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> the love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born of a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us, for he is your only son. Kurie eleison, webiyam achadatam chashodi leim abed chaye, and saber lachma beda kodi shanto ubarach ukodesh, waksu yabin tarmida karomara, Sabahula mehne kulhun, hono denita, fahro dila, dahlo faikun, wahlov sagie, metafaseu metiheb, usoyon, haume wa hoye dalakailam alamin. So dem sich um in Hamro, men mahayo, Barahu Kodesh, Uyabin Talmida, Kodomara, Sabishtawa Mehne, Kulhun, Hono Denita, Demo Dila Dia Tiki Hadato. Dahlo faikun wahlov sagiyem, mete shadu mete heb, usoyam haume wa haoye dan khaylam alameen. Amin. Do this in memory of me, each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who 
can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, a lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name, by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion, you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness, as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, implores your Father, saying, sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we glorify you we profess our faith in you and we rest upon this bread and wine that they become the one That this bread and the body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shout of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the venerable priests, the chaste deacons, the pure subdeacons, and all the orders of the church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully. With justice and holiness, may they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. For the poor and the dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and the distressed, 
for those tempted by evil spirits. Be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs and confessors, especially the holy, glorious and blessed ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who please you and profess your name, we pray to you, O Lord. faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world. Grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones, and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, the saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of thy angels. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. 
Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and holy spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life, O Lord our God, to you be glory. your body to eat in your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. O compassion and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Lord Jesus Christ, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. And we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kulchunna. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We care, we ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us. Protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the living cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So just a note for this coming week, because of the women's Ignatian exercises throughout this week, there will be no Masses Tuesday through Saturday, so Saturday included. So all this week, because of the women's retreat, no Masses, Tuesday through Saturday. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God to whom be glory forever.